In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer that we use during time of conflict, crisis, and disaster. O oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, Grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness. Of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God, wherever we may be. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us now join together in the prayer of the day found in our bulletin insert. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
first reading for today, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the 56th chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 67. Let us read together responsibly. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. God, our own God, has blessed us. May God give us blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. Our second reading for today comes from the 11th chapter of Romans, beginning at the first verse. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus called the crowd to him, and he said, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? And Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into the pit. Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Now Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Okay, let's get a few things straight here. First of all, Jesus does not call his woman a dog. Let's just put that out there for everybody. I know people get upset because it's like, look what Jesus did. Jesus shouldn't have done that. How can I follow God that disparages women or anybody else? But let's take a look at what's going on here. When we look at the big picture, maybe we can understand what is truly going on. First of all, this comes right after the feeding of the multitudes and the disciples going out in the midst of the storm and Jesus coming out on the water walking to them. And of course, Peter saying, Jesus, if it's really you, command me to come out of the boat. And we all know how that happened. It ended up. Well, now Jesus is teaching people about defilement. And it is a response to what the Pharisees and the scribes were getting on Jesus and his disciples for. Namely, that they were walking through the fields, picking up some of the wheat and eating it. Oh my gosh. But to them, that was sacrilege. And so they wanted to lecture Jesus and his disciples about things that defile. If you don't wash your hands correctly, if you take certain things and you eat them, you defile the body. And so Jesus said, without really saying it, you guys are idiots. What really defiles? Is it what you put in or what comes out? And so then Jesus tells them it is truly what comes out. Because what comes out from the mouth comes from the heart. The words that we use reveals the intentions of our heart. If they are good words, if they are loving words, if they are compassionate words, our heart is revealed. But if they are words of anger, of hate, if they are words that try to divide, then they, well, that is defilement. Now we are told by the disciples, they tell Jesus, you know, you really cheese these guys off. They're not happy with what you're saying. And so they head on over to Tyre and Sidon. Now, there's no wonder that Jesus heads over there because that is Gentile country. So in other words, the Jews have no dominion over that space. So even if they are upset with Jesus, even if they do want to hunt him down and kill him at that time, they could not go into the place and do it. So it is kind of like a safe place for him to be. And in fact, I think Jesus just wanted to go there to get away, just to take a pause for a moment. And he knew that he could do that over there. Except for this woman. This woman is called a Canaanite. Does anybody remember from Old Testament about the Jews and the Canaanites? Were they buddy-buddy? No. Does anybody remember what, when Moses said, was leading his people into the Promised Land, and once they got to the Promised Land, there were other people that were already there. The Canaanites happened to be one such group. And God told his people Israel, that you need to go and you need to eliminate these people. In fact, God said that you need to kill every man, woman, child, their ox, their cattle, their sheep. Everything that they pretty much touched needs to be eliminated. And how did that go? Well, obviously, she's a Canaanite woman. Obviously, God's instructions were not carried out. And 
and so this Canaanite woman would be an enemy of the people of Israel. The Israelites would have nothing to do with anyone from Cana or from that area. It's like oil and water. They just don't get along. They just don't mix. But not only that, she is a woman. And of course, as we have found out time and again, they occupy one of the lowest places in the social order. She should not even approach Jesus, and yet she does. And she approaches Jesus because she has a daughter, and this daughter has been inhabited by a demon. My kids, when they were growing up, when Nick was nine months old, he had a fever. Of course, every kid gets a fever. Of course, every parent's being new parents, you worry about it. And we were calling the doctor, and we were getting a little bit upset because it seems like it wasn't breaking. And in fact, it went from like 101 to 102, up to 103, then to 104. And then after a bunch more phone calls, the doctor's like, well, you better take him into the ER. By the time we got him into the ER, he was at 105.4. We were frantic. We didn't know what else to do, and so we went to the people who knew what they could do. And that's where I think this woman was. She had tried everything, and even the best doctors could not help her. So she wanted to go to the one place where she knew she could find some help, where she knew that Jesus would be. But she's a Canaanite woman. Canaanite people... Well, the reasons why God wanted to get them eliminated is because they didn't believe in God. They hated God. They wanted nothing to do with God. And here, this Canaanite woman, the enemy of Israel, the enemy of God, comes to Jesus. And she does something very profound. She says to Jesus, Lord, son of David, Lord, she, she looks at him and says, you are God. And not only that, but you are the son of David. You are the Messiah. Lord, the Messiah, help me. Save my daughter. And what is the disciples' response? Well, first of all, what is Jesus' response? What does he do? Does Jesus say, okay, Good to go. What's his response? His response was the response my last boss gave me when I asked her for a raise. He says nothing. He says absolutely nothing. And then she doesn't stop. And the disciples finally say, Jesus, Send her away. That's their answer to everything, isn't it? Send her away. Didn't they say the same things when, when the multitudes came? And it was getting later on, and they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, it's getting late. There's too many people. Send them away. What about the children when the children want to come up to Jesus? What do the disciples do? Jesus, send them away. That's their answer for everything. Get rid of them. And see, that's where I think Jesus begins to answer, not so much to her, but to his disciples. He begins to tell, begins to tell them that his mission is for the people of God, the chosen ones of God, that he has come into the world first for the Israelites. Now the woman understands that. What is her response? First Jesus is quiet. Then Jesus basically says, not my problem. What does this woman do? What would you do? What would you do? When God is silent, or when God doesn't answer your prayers, or when God maybe answers your prayers in a way you didn't want Him to answer your prayers, what do you do? Yeah, you get upset, don't you? 
Sometimes you have further discussion with God, and sometimes maybe you raise your voice a little bit more. Sometimes you even put in a few things that maybe you probably shouldn't. Or maybe, just maybe, you say, well, God, um, how about this? How about if you do this for me, I'll do this for you? How about, God, if you answer my prayer, I swear I'll be in church every Sunday. And God, if you really answer this prayer, not only will I be in church, but I will volunteer to be on church council. Or maybe it's something different. God, if you do this for me, well then, I will be nicer to other people. You see, we try and broker a deal with God sometimes, don't we? Even though we don't think so, we actually do that a lot. God, if you do this, I will do this for you. But she doesn't do any of that. She doesn't get angry. She doesn't try and play let's make a deal. She doesn't stomp her feet. She doesn't turn around and say, I'm done with you. Rather, she continues to have faith. She continues to hold out hope, knowing that he is indeed God, and that he, and he alone, is the only one who can help her. Lord, help me. Same words Peter said when he was going under, wasn't it? Lord, save me. So this Canaanite woman, she does something interesting. She gets down on her knees. You know what the Greek word for kneeling means? Same word we use for worship. She worships him. Instead of being angry, instead of turning around, instead of saying you're worthless, she begins to worship him. But then Jesus, and this is where I think people get all upset, they go off on the rails, Jesus begins to use an illustration. And he talks about being there for the people of Israel first. So he uses this illustration. Now we've all used illustrations when we teach, don't we? Has anybody ever tried to teach their kids and they may have used a story about, I don't know, the tortoise and the hare? Slow and steady wins the race. Does that mean you called your kid a tortoise or a hare? No, it means you used an illustration so they might understand what you're trying to say to them. Well, Jesus is doing the same thing. He's not calling this woman a dog. So let's get over ourselves on this one. Jesus is using an illustration. Now, it's an illustration that she alone would understand, maybe not the disciples. And why is that? Well, because the Jews don't like dogs. They don't domesticate them. They don't like them around. They think they're unclean. They think they're just stinking, rotten animals. They do not have them in their houses. They do not have dogs as pets. The Greeks, the Gentiles, however, do. They have lap dogs, they have house dogs, they have working dogs, and these dogs live in the houses with their owners. They are fed from the table. They lay underneath the table in hopes that food, just as my dogs hope, magically appear out of nowhere. And they know the table is the place where it shall be. So Jesus uses an illustration that she would understand. That it is not fair to take the food from the children and give it to the dogs. You would understand this, madam. You would not take the food intended for your daughter and bring your dog up on the table so he could eat it and make your daughter get on the floor and eat whatever's in the dog dish, would you? She still does not get angry. She still does not walk away. She still doesn't reach up and slap him in the face. She has such faith and such hope that she says yes. She doesn't disagree with them. 
She says, yes, I understand your mission is first for the people of God. But I also know in my heart, Lord, that your love is so great that there is an abundance. That there is such an abundance with God that even the scraps from his table, the crumbs that fall through the cracks, are more than enough for all of us. And Jesus looks at her and says, such faith. It doesn't come from the disciples, does it? No. It comes from a Gentile, a Canaanite, an enemy of God. It comes from a foreigner in a foreign place. <laughs> Do you realize that with all the disciples been through, with the feeding of the multitudes, Jesus coming out, walking on the water, they still do not know who Jesus is. How do we know that? Well, let's look a few pages ahead. Let's see if I can find it. Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and he says to them, Who do people say that I am? And the disciples say, Oh, some say you are Elijah. Some say you are John the baptizer. And then Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, You are the Lord. You are the Messiah. And what does Jesus say to him? You could not have known that on your own, but it must have been revealed to you by God. This is after the feeding of the multitudes. This is after Jesus walking on the water. This is after Jesus dealing with a Canaanite woman. And they still don't understand. This woman of faith understood. This woman of faith knew who God was. And she trusted in Him. She trusted Him to be able to do the impossible. And even at first, if there was silence, even if there was a no, even if there were three no's, even if there were infinite no's, she still would have trusted. She still would have prayed. She still would have said, Father, I know that you will answer my prayers. I think Jesus was teaching his disciples. They were the ones that couldn't see they were the ones that had no faith. He was hoping they would come to have the faith that this woman had. You know how many times Jesus is amazed by people in their faith? I think three times. And you know who these people are? They're all Gentiles. They're not Jews. They're not children of Abraham. They are Gentiles. Not only this Canaanite woman, but the centurion who sends for Jesus because his servant is sick and near death. And so Jesus comes and the centurion hears that Jesus is on his way and he sends a messenger saying, Jesus, you didn't need to come. All you had to do was say the word and I know he would have been healed. You see, I'm a centurion, I have command over a hundred people. And when I tell them to do something, they do it. So I know that if you command this to happen, it will happen. And Jesus is amazed at his faith. A Gentile, not a disciple, not a Jew, but a Gentile. Jesus is amazed. There was another parable that Jesus used. He talked about a woman of faith. Then Jesus told them a parable about the need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, 
Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Doesn't seem like he found it in anybody around him. But he did find it. He found it in the most unlikely of places, in the most unlikely of people. And this was the example he was holding up for his disciples. He was in essence saying, you've followed me all along, you've seen everything I've done, you've heard every word I've spoken, and yet you don't have a tenth of the faith that this woman has. Learn from her. Be like her. Trust in me. Know that whatever happens, I know it's going to happen. And that whatever you ask of me, it shall be done. You see, this was another teaching moment for Jesus, for his disciples. It's a teaching moment for each and every one of us. Ask unceasingly, believing that God will answer. Knowing that even if we get a no, or we get silence, or whatever it is we may get, trust that God is a God of abundance, and out of that abundance, He will surely bless us. He will surely answer our prayers. That He knows what we need. He doesn't care what we want, but He knows what we need. And He will most assuredly give that to us. Trust. And know that your prayers are answered. Expect them to be answered. Just not exactly maybe the way we want them to be. But they will be answered.
confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth. Grant your grace to all your creatures that the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by garbage, renew soils stripped of nutrients, and refresh the air all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests, contending alliances, and consumed by enormous worry. Bless us and make your, front, make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and towns, and for those who need your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Grant our congregation St. Peter's grace to find our life refreshed in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late sun. Give us rest and renewal, and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them on the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of those who are in need. We pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for our neighbors, our friends. We pray for our enemies, Father. We pray for all who are hurting, all who are suffering all who are feeling injustices, who are dealing with hate. We pray for those, Father, who have been inflicted by man-made and natural disasters. We pray, Father, for unification, not only of our country, but of this world. We pray, Father, that we might truly come to know you and follow you, that we may know that we can call out to you and you will answer our prayers. Help us to be expected in that. But most of all, Father, we ask for your peace, your healing, your comfort, your presence among all your people. We lift up today to you, Father, Bill, Kelsey, Rich, Roger, Josh, Cindy, Mary, Norma, Eloise, Kathy, Fran, Eric, Sue, Dick, Charlotte, Sue, Tom, Joe, Cheryl, Shirley, Pat, Tori, Darlene, Elizabeth, Rosa, Bensie, Elaine, Bob. Father, we ask that you comfort and be with Sarah Lasky's family as they mourn her loss. That as she was such a huge part of their life and their love, let them continue forward, Father, sharing their stories and remembrances. But most of all, Father, help them to live out the faith that she showed them to live. We give you thanks, Father, that Rich continues to heal and improve each and every day. And we pray for a full recovery and we are thankful that he is here with us once again. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always.
keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.